In this tutorial, we'll learn how to train a lasso regression model in R. So to get started, let's first go to R Studio. You'll see that our console window is already open, but let's go ahead to, and go to File, New File, R Script to open up an R Script editor window here. And I'll make some notes here, to, at least to begin with. I'm going to walk you through conceptually just very briefly what we're going to be doing with lasso regression and how we're going to apply lasso regression within a k-fold cross-validation framework. So what we're talking about here is lasso regression in R. And so what does lasso stand for? Well lasso is going to stand for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. And I'll, as I walk through conceptually what lasso regression does, hopefully that label, that name, least absolute shrinkage and selection operator becomes a little bit more clear. And I also want to make a note here that we are building, or let's say training, a lasso regression in this particular tutorial using a k-fold cross-validation framework. So this is one of the common frameworks that you can employ, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, as well as demonstrate how we're actually going to train a lasso regression model using k-fold cross-validation. And importantly, it's important to note that lasso regression is a type of machine learning more broadly, and more specifically, it's a type of supervised statistical learning, or sometimes just called supervised machine learning, or supervised um, learning just uh, as another term that's relatively synonymous with the others that I've mentioned. Okay, so lasso regression is a, what is called a regularization method and a form of supervised statistical learning, as I mentioned. Now, it's often applied in contexts in which we have a lot of predictor variables that we can deploy in order to predict a particular outcome of interest. And so that's important to remember here. We usually reserve this method for, say, when we have instances where we have 30 or more predictor variables. Although in some cases, especially when people are working with big data, um, where you have vast volumes of data, including having many, many predictor variables in the thousands, perhaps. Sometimes you'll see lasso regression used with a thousand or more predictor variables. And so the goal of lasso regression is to improve model prediction. And so I'll make a note here because this is something that you really want to keep in the back of your mind in terms of deciding when to use lasso regression. So we're trying to improve model prediction accuracy or um, classification accuracy, whatever your performance metric that you're trying to improve. And so typically we don't deploy lasso regression if we think about the goals of science being to understand, to explain, to determine the cause of, and to predict. With lasso regression, we're really focusing on just that last goal of science, which is to predict. And it's not going to be as useful of a tool when it comes to understand or explaining a phenomenon of interest. It's really about optimizing prediction and being able to predict with greater accuracy or depending on the type of model we deploy within glass or regression, maybe perhaps classifying an outcome more accurately um, and so forth and so on. So lasso regression is a really good exploratory tool and that's important to keep in mind as well. Okay, so it's really about prediction and for exploring the predictor variables that are going to optimize those predictions. Um, and so with lasso regression, we're really thinking about a, a number of key terms, and I'll start with shrinkage first. And so with lasso regression, it's only going to select the most important predictor variables for an outcome by shrinking the regression coefficients associated with the least important predictor variables down to zero. Okay? And in doing so, lasso regression can reduce the amount of shrinkage that occurs when a trained model is applied to new or fresh data. Now, shrinkage refers to a reduction in model performance, such as a reduction in variance explained in the outcome, if you think about R squared. Um, and so it's that reduction in model performance when the model itself is applied to data from a new sample. So data that has not yet been seen by that model um, in, is, is another way of saying that. So in general, lasso regression is most often applied for the following reasons. The first reason, is in addition to just avoiding shrinkage or reducing the amount of shrinkage more generally, is to avoid, we want to avoid overfitting the model. So whatever model we end up training, we want to avoid overfitting the model to the training data, okay? And so this is something that happens, we can make 
uh, we can specify models that predict extremely well, or in other words, explain the outcome or are very accurate within the, mod within the data that we've actually trained them on. But when we apply those models sometimes to fresh data, to new data that the model hasn't yet seen, it's because it's been so carefully tailored to the training data, it's not going to work well and perform well to test data. So there's this kind of balance between helping uh, predict as much as you can with the training data while also trying to acknowledge that you want this model to generalize beyond the training data to other data from the population of interest. So that's one thing that we want to avoid with, um, with and that we can avoid using lasso regression is we can avoid overfitting the model, which typically means that our model is going to be more predictive um, of a particular outcome when we apply it to new data. Now, other types of regression techniques, such as ordinary least squares, linear regression, and, and uh, specifically generalized linear models, such as logistic re regression, binary logistic regression, and so forth, um, these do tend to, if you apply these and then try to use them for prediction, these models, if you apply them to training data, they tend to overfit the model to the data at hand, and then they don't generalize as well and perform as well with new data. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, and that's especially the case when we have a large number of predictor variables. Okay, so what's the other thing that we want to, um, why we might apply lasso regression? Well, the other reason is selecting, um, or rather to select only the most important predictor variables. And that's the most important predictor variables in terms of predicting the outcome of interest with a high degree of accuracy or a more degree or a higher degree of accuracy. So these are generally the two reasons that we'd apply lasso regression. So again, it's about prediction. It's about making sure that whatever model we train is going to be as predictive as possible um, when we give it new data from that same underlying population. And we also use it when we try to figure out, okay, which variables, predictive variables, are the most important? Because again, what it does to that shrinkage process is it's gonna pull certain regression coefficients closer to zero, and some are gonna be pulled all the way to zero, and a regression coefficient becomes zero, it essentially cancels out, or it effectively cancels out that, that predictor variable to which it's associated. So this brings us to our next point, which is the concept of regularization when it comes to lasso regression. So lasso regression is what's called a regularization method. And specifically, it's a L1 regularization method. So I'll put a little note here, just noting that it's an L1 regularization method. And so that's not necessarily super important to remember in this context, but the reason I say that is that there's different types of regularization methods. And you can other regularization methods that are related to lasso regression include ridge regression and elastic net. Okay, and so they're fairly similar to implement. And typically what we do in practice is that we might actually pit these models against each other using the same data, the same training data. We might try to train models using lasso regression, using ridge regression and elastic net regression, which are again, all regularization methods, and then see which one is going to better predict the outcome of interest when we give it new data, okay? So, so what do I mean by a regularization method? Well, the purpose of a regularization method is to actually reduce the variance of the parameters estimates, which are gonna be your regression coefficients in this context. Now, the goal is to reduce that variance of those parameter estimates, even if that reduction comes at the cost of introducing or allowing some additional bias to creep in. Okay, so ultimately this means finding that optimal level of model complexity. And we'll revisit these concepts of of variance and bias in just a moment, but I'll just make a quick note here for your own records that we're trying to reduce variance in parameter estimates, even if this means increasing or adding additional bias, okay? And bias meaning how far those regression coefficients or parameter estimates stray from their true population values. Because remember with inferential statistics, we're trying to estimate what those true population parameters or values are. And that's why these are called parameter estimates. And specifically we're talking about regression coefficients here, okay? All right, so this brings us to the next concept related to, uh, related to not touring, but <laughs> tuning. Uh, is called tuning. 
And so with tuning, what we're interested in, and this is really a major function of lasso regression, is that we have what are called tuning parameters. And these tuning parameters are called alpha tuning parameter, okay? And then we also have lambda. Now, alpha is really what's called a mixing percentage, and we set this to one when we're doing lasso regression. So actually alpha is going to be a constant for us when we're doing lasso regression. And we just need to remember that we set it to one. If we set it to zero, then we'd be estimating a ridge regression model, which I mentioned before is a type of regularization. Okay, so for our purposes, alpha is gonna be set to one. And so we're gonna kind of forget about it because it's not something that we are gonna vary or tune to see how well um, we can predict by varying alpha. with. With lasso regression, alpha is set to one, which I note there. Now, lambda is what we're really interested in when it comes to lasso regression, because this is actually a parameter that we're going to tune. And so what is lambda? Well, um, lambda is going to be the actual value that we use to, that this is actually going to be our regularization parameter or tuning parameter here, okay? So this is what we're using for tuning with lasso regression and specifically regularization, okay? And so again, as I mentioned before, the goal with regularization is to reduce that variance in the parameter estimates, even if it means introducing more bias surrounding those parameter estimates, okay? So this is really at the heart of, um, of lasso regression is setting the alpha tuning parameter one, so that becomes a constant, and then we are going to provide a series or a vector of lambda values and feed that into the training process to find and tune to that value of lambda for which we can really optimize what will end up being this balance between we're trying to optimize model accuracy with model parsimony, okay? So in other words, we're trying to come up with a model that is as accurate as possible in terms of predicting the outcome and has the least amount of error as possible but also we wanna consider how parsimonious that model is. And so in the type of regression that we're looking at today, that will mean the number of regression parameters or regression um, estimates that we're trying to estimate, okay? And so the fewest number of regression coefficients that we can actually have non-zero values is really our goal while also maintaining model accuracy. And this is one way that we can hope to help avoid or reduce the amount of shrinkage we would normally see with more conventional types of regression, such as ordinary least squares linear regression or um, typical conventional generalized linear models such as logistic regression. Okay, so again, we're trying to focus on reducing variance even if it comes at the extents, uh, expense of bias. So, and how do we achieve this optimal level of model accuracy compared to model parsimony? Well, finding that optimal balance between those is really about identifying what is called, often referred to as the optimal lambda value, and sometimes it's called the best lambda value. This is really what we're striving to, is to tune the model to find that, that balance there where we can have um, a model that's, again, going to be as accurate as possible while also being as parsimonious as possible as well, okay? So that is the focus here that we're gonna be doing today is trying to, when we're training the model, we're going to be running the model through a number of iterations and we'll be doing this within K-fold cross-validation with the end goal being to identify what is that optimal lambda value and then we're gonna use that lambda value to then estimate the model when we give it new data. So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to tune that. So how do we find that optimal uh, lambda value? Well, the type of outcome or metric, uh, model performance metric that we're gonna focus on is really what we're going to use to set that, to find that optimal level of lambda. And there's a number of different performance metrics that we might focus on. So if we're focusing on linear models, so if we wanna use lasso regression to let's say predict a continuous outcome variable like job performance or something like that, then we typically would focus on what is called root mean squared error as a performance metric, which RMSE, or we could also focus on R squared, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which would be variance explained in the outcome by the model. And also there is, uh, we can also focus, sometimes you'll see mean squared error used as well. 
Although typically we tend to focus more on um, using root mean squared error, um, which is a little bit more interpretable. So you can use either, but typically we use root mean squared or RMSE today. Um, that tends to be the one that we focus on. And then if we were to have, let's say, a generalized linear model form of, uh, of Lasso regression, where let's say we're trying to estimate a binary logistic regression model, meaning that we have two levels or a dichotomous outcome variable, then we typically would use either um, Cohen's kappa as our performance metric in order to identify again what that optimal lambda value is, so Cohen's kappa, or a classification accuracy. Okay, and so really there's gonna be defaults and I'll show you that today, what the defaults are within the, the functions uh, that we're gonna be applying today, but you can manually select which ones of these that you want to, your model to focus on when it's tuning the lambda parameter and finding that optimal value, okay? But typically, let's say if you're using root mean square error, RMSE, the goal is going to be to find that uh, lambda value that minimizes, finds a minimal value of RMSE you could also set it to so that it finds the within one standard error, that minimal value of RMSC um, and finds the optimal lambda value within that, okay? All right, so those are the model performance metrics that help us identify the optimal um, lambda value. And the next thing to consider is the model type selection. So we need to think about, as I've been alluding to thus far, that we can apply lasso regression to different types of, um, different types of outcomes and different types of models within it. So let's use, so if we're trying to uh, create a lasso regression that's going to approximate OLS or ordinary least squares linear regression, then the equivalent that we'd focus on um, in lasso regression is just a linear lasso regression model. Now let's say that we were trying to do a type of generalized linear model, let's say like um, binary logistic regression, then the equivalent would be applying a, um, a logistic lasso regression. Okay, so there is some flexibility here. Now, originally lasso regression was developed to be used with uh, continuous outcomes and to specify linear models, but it's been expanded so that you can apply it to the uh, generalized linear model framework to it as well, and family of analyses such as, again, binary list logistic regression, multinomial uh, logistic regression, and so forth and so on. Okay, so in other words, it can handle categorical variables and outcome variables as well. So in this tutorial, we're gonna focus on a linear lasso regression, but just note that you could also do a, um, a binary logistic regression model using lasso regression too. And then you could pit it against just a traditional generalized linear model use that specifies logistic regression um, and see how well, how much better um, a lasso regression actually performs when you apply it to new data. So what is its predictive accuracy in other words, okay? Now, as I mentioned at the very top of this presentation, the beginning of this presentation, cross-validation is gonna be an important part of, and typically this is what we use when we try to identify that optimal lambda value. So when we're trying to tune that lambda value to arrive at the optimal level, we typically wanna do this using a cross-validation approach, okay? And we're specifically going to be applying K-fold cross-validation. And even more specifically, we'll be uh, if you want to replace the K with the actual number of folds, we're going to be doing 10-fold cross-validation today in this tutorial. Now, the reason that we do this is also then in general cross-validation and specifically K-fold cross-validation, it's a good framework for trying to, um, again, it's another way of reducing shrinkage that I was talking about earlier. Um, in terms of how well the model performed on our training data compared to when we actually give it new data where the new data is often referred to the test data, okay? So that's another advantage of doing this. It can just help you get to really what is going to be the best or optimal lambda value um, given the, the data from the population, okay? And it'll give you a much better idea of how that, that uh, a model with that lambda va value is going to perform when you do end up applying it to or giving it new data. Now, we are also going to be doing cross-validation in a broader predictive analytics or um, often called predictive modeling framework. And so that's important to take in context too, context too because not only are we doing a K-fold cross-validation, and if you need more of a background on K-fold cross-validation, take a look at and follow along with the tutorial that's really focusing on K-fold cross-validation, which is called K-fold cross-validation in R. 
Um, but we are going to train the model using k-fold cross-validation and then using a broader predictive analytics framework, we're then going to take that model that we've trained using that training data and then we are going to apply it to test data subsequently. Okay, And so we're going to be using kind of the conventional 80-20 random uh, split of the data, which means that 80% um, is going to go to our training data and 20% is going to go to our testing data, our test data rather. And you could do a 90-10 split. And, and part of this is considering how many folds that you're gonna perform as well as, as part of your cross-validation as well as um, how much data you have and so forth and so on. And so that's important to consider as well. But we're gonna do an 80-20 split here as I demonstrate this today, okay? And that's gonna be part of our predictive analytics process. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna move on to do is to actually do the initial steps um, that we typically follow when it comes to uh, reading in our data and so forth and so on. So as far as initial steps go, I'll make a note here, these are the initial steps that we're gonna carry out. This is where the tutorial really starts in terms of applying and actually reading in our data and so forth, is that first I'm gonna set my working directory, and I advise that you do the same thing. So set your working directory. I know that mine off the top of my head is my um, H drive and my R workshop folder within the H drive is where the data that we're gonna use for today's presentation live on my computer, or that rather that's the drive in which they live. And so I've set my working directory to my H drive R workshop folder. The next thing that I'm gonna do is uh, read in the data so I'm going to access the library um, function and specifically use the library function to access the reader package. And this is the reader package from the tidyverse. And I'm gonna run that. And here you can see that I ran it. Um, I had already installed this, but if you hadn't installed the reader package before, you would just do install packages reader and you would run that there before you use the library function or if you need to update that package, that's another way of doing that. Okay, so we're gonna read in the data and I'm gonna just name this data something really simple, this data frame object that we're about to read in. And, and specifically we're reading in, it's technically because we're using the reader package and the read underscore CSV function, it's going to be what's called a tibble, um, which is, is fairly specific to the tidyverse universe of uh, packages. It's, it's a more, um, I, I guess you could say, advanced form of a data frame object. And so we'll read that in. So, and we'll use the left-handed arrow operator here to read it in as DF, lowercase DF, and that'll be our data frame object. And again, we're gonna use the read underscore CSV function from that reader package. And I know that the name of this data file that I've saved to my working directory, which is again, my R, my H drive and R workshop folder is the, is just lasso all undercase or lowercase rather, dot CSV, okay? So let's run that, open up the data here. And now you can see that we have a thousand observations. So let's say that's a thousand employees or cases and 37 variables. And so let's view the data here. And you can see that automatically deployed the view function with a capital V. And the variables we have access to here, Y is going to be our outcome here. Note that it's all the letters here are lowercase. So it's Y, X1. So X1 through x36, these are our 36 predictor variables here. There's no real context here that we're focusing on in this tutorial. And from a human resource management perspective, we're just going to assume that these are all variables. And the reason I did this, uh, these are all variables that would be relevant. Let's say this is an outcome we care about. It's a continuous outcome in this case. So let's say that it's performance or something like that. And these are all the different fields or variables we have access to. Um, in our databases or um, survey data or whatever else we can link to um, our performance data, our Y variable, and to see what is going to be the most predictive. Because remember, last regression is about prediction and it's about um, what's called feature selection or variable selection, meaning refining your list of predictors, some of which will be kind of essentially eliminated from model prediction to find what are gonna be the ones that are most essential when it comes to predicting the outcome or most important, okay? All right, so this is, uh, these are the variables we're working with today. Let's peek at the characteristics of those data by using the, the structure function there. So str, and just put the name of the data frame as the sole parenthetical argument, click run. Okay, as you can see, um, I'll save you the suspense. All these variables are of type numeric here. 
Okay, so that's we're dealing with all numeric data here. This is not necessarily going to be um, often if you're throwing a lot of variables at a lasso in a lasso regression variable uh, regression model at a particular outcome. You'll probably have variables that are of type um, that are going to be categorical, so they'd be of um, character type or factor type or, or something like that. And so, and maybe some of that are specifically numeric, but even more specifically of type integer. And so this is just a toy example here, and uh, but that's just something to consider too, is that you probably in real life might have a variety of different types of uh, variable types as predictors in your model. Okay, so we've now successfully done that. And for the purposes of this tutorial, we're gonna assume that all the statistical assumptions of linear regression have been met. And that's another thing to note with um, lasso regression is that because you can deploy different types of, of um, model models within lasso regression, so as I mentioned before, we're going to do linear lasso regression today. Alternatively, you could do uh, logistic regression as well with, within lasso regression. You really need to adhere to the statistical assumptions that need to be met for those types of regression. Now, with that said, um, lasso regression is actually a pretty good technique when it comes to addressing multicollinearity. Um, and this is addressed by the way in which it shrinks the parameter estimates closer to zero and some of which actually go to zero. Um, so if you have two overlapping variables, it's typically gonna pull um, one or both of those closer to zero and this can actually reduce the amount of collinearity um, in terms of the parameter estimates and regression coefficients themselves, okay? But just make sure that the, the statistical assumptions have been met. So um, we're gonna assume that they've been met here for this linear regression model. Um, and now the next thing that we're going to do, and I'm going to do several asterisks here so this stands out for us, is that we are going to be partitioning the data. Okay, and so why are we partitioning the data? Well, this is to make sure that we have that training data frame and a test data frame. So I mentioned earlier this idea of an 80-20% uh, 20, 80, split in terms of 80% of the cases being randomly assigned to our training data and 20% to the test data. This is so we can deploy what would be considered a true predictive modeling or predictive analytics framework, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna do is, if you haven't already, and I'm gonna put, an, I'm gonna put a, a pound sign in front of this because I have already. If you haven't already, um, you will need to install the caret package, okay? And it's just caret, C-A-R-E-T, all lowercase. And so if you do need to run that, you would just not put the hashtag in front of it and just install that package. Or if you need to update it, you would want to do that now before you use the library function to access that caret package. And so I've already recently installed the caret package and updated it. So I'm just going to use a library function to access the functions within the caret package. So I just enter the name of caret as a sole parenthetical argument and run that. Sometimes it takes a second for this to load. And so you can see there, finally, we got the stop sign to go away there in our console window. Um, so we're ready. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing next is we're gonna use the create data partition function from the caret package. And we're gonna use this to partition, which is just another word, to, another way of saying splitting the data, uh, such that 80% of the cases will be randomly assigned to one split. That's gonna be our training data frame. And then the remaining 20% will be uh, assigned to the other split, okay? Now, before doing this though, it's advisable to set um, a seed, okay? So this is setting what's called, uh, sometimes referred to as setting a random seed. And I'm just gonna, you can put whatever numeric value you want in there. I'm just going to put the integer 1985 here, or 1,985, you can put whatever you want. By putting a specific integer numeric value in here, what you're doing is you're allowing your results to be reproducible because we're doing a random split right now. We're about to do a random split. And what that means is that it would be inherently random. And if you didn't set the seed, you wouldn't be able to re reproduce the same results um, if you reran your script multiple times. This allows us to reproduce uh, the results each time. So in a sense, what we're about to do is not truly random if we're able to set the seed here, but essentially, um, that's what's happening behind the scenes. And so make sure that you, and we'll use the set.seed argument again from base R a little bit later on when we, before we um, perform our k-fold cross-validation. Um, but for now, we're going to do it before we randomly partition or split the data. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to partition, which again is just another word for saying, another way of saying split, and create what's called, a, we'll call an index matrix 
of selected values, okay? And so to do so, we're gonna create an object and I just arbitrarily calling this index, all lowercase, and I'm assigning what we're, um, this index matrix we're about to create to this index object using the left-handed arrow operator. And we're gonna use the create data partition function from, uh, uh, from the caret package. So it's create data partition with a capital D for data, capital P for partition. partition. And as the first argument, we specify the name of our data frame followed by dollar sign and our outcome variable of interest, which here is Y, okay? So it's name of your data frame and then dollar sign um, and the name of your outcome variable. And as you can see here, um, what this is saying is we're saying that this outcome variable here belongs to this data frame and that's what the dollar sign operator, um, how it operates. Okay, so the next argument, the second argument, we're gonna say P is set to 0.8, okay? So this is where we're saying, okay, what is the size of this partition? So um, here we're saying that 80% or a proportion of 0.8 of the cases are gonna be randomly assigned to this index um, matrix object that we are about to create here, okay? So if you wanted to do a 90-10 split, you would put 0.9 here, okay? But we're gonna do 0.8. And then the next object is list equals false, okay? And what we're saying here is by list not being equal to true, so by, so by default, then that means list is equal to false here. It says that we don't want a list, we want a matrix object here, okay? And then finally, the last argument is gonna be times equals one. And this is just saying we wanna only split or partition the data once. Okay, so we'll do one split where we say 80% of the data get assigned to this um, index matrix we're about to create here, okay? So let's create that index matrix by running this. And now you'll see we have a matrix object here. Okay, and this, by default, it'll say resample one typically. And what you'll see is that in our data frame, remember we have these row numbers here which is not part of a formal variable. It's just in R, it helps, it's a reference here. So these are the row numbers. And so you see it's sequential one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way up to a thousand for the a thousand observations or cases we have in this particular data frame. If we look at our index object here, this matrix, we'll see that now these are the corresponding row numbers in this resample column from this data frame object. And you'll see instead of going sequentially from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to a thousand, it goes one, two, skips three to four, five, uh, skips six, seven to eight. And so this is this is our random 80% selection that we just specified. Now, one of the things that I've noticed with this create data partition function is that um, sometimes it's not going to give you exactly 80%. So we have a thousand observations here. So 80% would be 800 exactly. Here we get 801. It's not a huge deal here. Um, we've got, this is a lot of data. This is not gonna be consequential in, in a meaningful way that we have 801 entries here instead of 800. Sometimes if you play around with the variable type, um, you can, especially if your outcome variable is of type, um, uh, is, is of, sometimes if your outcome variable is of type factor, uh, or of rather not of type factor, but if you convert it to type factor, if that makes sense given your data. So if you converted it from, let's say, uh, numeric integer or character, but it, um, to factor, and this would be especially relevant if you had an ordinal variable or a categorical or nominal variable as the outcome, such as turnover, stay versus quit, so a binary or dichotomous outcome, then converting it to a factor sometimes will address this issue. But I'd say it's more of a non-issue. And so just go ahead and roll with it. We've got 801 cases or entries here assigned to this instead of 800, not that big of a deal, okay? All right, so we've randomly now, or we've created this index matrix. And now the next thing we're gonna do is apply this to our data frames to actually create the, um, a training data frame and a uh, test data frame, okay? To represent that 80-20 split. Okay, so we're going to create our test and training data frames. Okay, and so how do we do this? Well, first let's note the name of our, uh, what we'd like to call our training data frame. We'll call this train underscore DF. That's completely arbitrary. You can call it whatever you want, but I'm gonna call it train underscore DF all lowercase and use the left-handed arrow operator to assign the values to it that will become that 
data frame object. And so to do so, we can just specify the name of our data frame object, the original one, which is df. And then we use the brackets, okay? And as the within the brackets, just put the name of our index function, our index matrix object, which was index, okay? And then comma. And this is just saying that we want to select by rows. So what we're doing is we're going to say, let's select all of these values here. So these are the row numbers from this data frame. That's all we're doing here. So this first one is just going to take that 80% or well, slightly more than 80% as we saw it was 801 cases and apply them to this training underscore DF data frame, okay? And then the second argument would be, and before I run that is just, we'll create a, a test data frame and this is gonna be our holdout test data, okay? And so this is just, I'm gonna call this test underscore DF here, all lowercase, use the left-handed arrow operator. Very similar argument structure here or operation structure here, except the difference is going to be, we're just gonna add a minus sign in front of index. And this is just saying, we're gonna select everything uh, or retain only those cases that do not appear in this index matrix, okay? So we're essentially filling in the gap. So this will be the remaining cases here. Now let's run this and see what happens, okay? If you get an error message like this, which I was anticipating, this indicates that um, our data frame object is not playing for, uh, nicely with this, um, with this notation here and with our index matrix object that we've created. And likely the reason is that our data frame object, we read in the data as a type um, using the read underscore CSV function from the, the reader package, which is from the tidyverse universal package. And what that does is it reads it in as a tibble. And so more specifically, this is not a data frame, it's a tibble, and this is not playing nicely here. So what can we do here? Uh, well, fortunately, our solution is going to be relatively straightforward. And what we can do is simply, oops, don't want to lose that bracket there. We are going to, I'll just make a note here, to address error message. We are going to convert DF to data frame object, okay? So it's a tibble currently, the data frame, or this, this DF object, and which again is a kind of an enhanced version of a, of a data frame, but it's not purely a data frame object. And so if we want to make it just like a classic pure data frame object, then we can do, let's just overwrite the existing data, uh, this existing DF object by using DF and the left-handed arrow operator. And then we're gonna use the as.data.frame function from base R. And just as the sole parenthetical argument, put in the name of our, um, that tibble object, so the DF, click run. Okay, that looks like it was successful. We got blue text there. And now I'm just gonna copy what we just did above and paste it below. And this should work now. Okay, so as you can see, we get blue text there and no error message that we saw here. And now we have um, a training data frame object with 801 observations and a test um, data frame object with 199. So in other words, the remaining. So 801 plus 109 equals 1,000 observations. Okay, so now we've finished partitioning the data. Uh, which means that we're now ready to move on to the next step, which is specifying um, a k-fold cross-validation modeling framework. Okay, so to specify that k-fold cross-validation, and specifically, um, it's gonna we're gonna do a ten-fold cross-validation, given that we have access to so much data. Um, so we have access to a thousand or rather 801 observations within our training data frame, which is what we're going to apply the k-fold cross-validation to and specifically the tenfold cross-validation. Um, we have the luxury of being able to do a tenfold cross-validation. Now, if you had fewer uh, or less data than a thousand or specifically when we um, do the training data frame, we have 801 cases or observations here. If you had uh, less than that, then you'd likely want to do um, lower levels of k-fold. You can do you know, two, three-fold cross-validation if you have much smaller sets of data. Let's say you only have a sample of you know, two or 300, then you might only do two or three cross-validation. If you have a sample of 500, uh, for example, in your training data frame, you might only do um, five-fold uh, cross-validation. It really comes down to considering how big 
of a sample size you're gonna have when trying to um, estimate each version of the model as part of the k-fold cross-validation process within each fold. If you wanna, again, learn more about what that entails, go check out the k-fold cross-validation in our tutorial for more information on uh, k-fold cross-validation specifically. Because k-fold cross-validation is not the focal point of this tutorial, we're really focusing on just using it as a framework for training our lasso regression. I'm not gonna provide a lot of explanation around it. So again, go to that K-fold cross-validation in our tutorial if you wanna learn more about it. Okay, so what we're going to do, and I'll add some more hashtags there so that stands out a little bit more. We're going to start off by specifying that we wanna do a 10-fold cross-validation um, as a training method. Okay, which in other words, is just a framework for training our model, okay? And so the, we're gonna use what's called the train control function from the caret package. And first we need though, and we're gonna create an object that we can assign all the training information to. So the training method information and all our specifications for our k-fold cross-validation. And so I'm gonna create an object just called control specs. So just abbreviated uh, C-T-R-L-S-P-E-C-S, all lowercase. And using the left-handed arrow, we're gonna assign whatever comes out of the train control function from the caret package. So again, it's the train control function and whatever comes out of it is gonna be assigned to this object that we can then ref reference when we actually go to train our lasso regression, okay? So um, this is the train control function. It's just control with a capital C there, as you can see. The first argument is going to be method equals and we can just put CV, all lowercase, so in quotation marks there, this says that we want cross-validation, okay? So that's our um, first argument. Our second argument is going to be number equals 10, and this says this is specifying the number of folds that we want for our, our cross-validation. So this is saying we want a 10-fold cross-validation. If we only wanted to do a three-fold cross-validation or a five-fold cross-validation, we would set this to, um, those values numerically. And we could also do more than 10 as well, okay? Um, if we had lots of data at our disposal. All right, so that's our second argument. I'm gonna return down, and our third argument down here on the next line is going to be save predictions. Save predictions with a capital P for predictions. And I'm going to put in quotation marks, inform it to save all of these predictions, okay? So again, this is our specifications our, for our training. We're saying, okay, when we train the last regression, we wanted to do k-fold cross-validation and save all the predictions, and specifically we wanted to do a 10-fold 10 10, 10 cross-validation process. Okay, so let's be sure to run this. Okay, and now we have an object here. It's not gonna look like much if we take a look at it here, but it, this is all the specifications for our, mo our model behind the scenes there, okay? All right, so now the next step is going to be to specify and train our lasso regression model. Okay, and so the first step that we're gonna do here is um, we want to create a vector of potential lambda values. And so lambda should sound familiar. This is our tuning parameter of interest with lasso regression. This is our regularization uh, tuning parameter. And so specifically what we're going to do is just using um, the idea that we can assign vector object or vector values to a particular object name. We're just gonna create an object. I'm gonna call it lambda underscore vector, all lowercase. And I'm gonna assign a sequence of potential lambda values to this vector. Uh, now, here's what I recommend doing here is um, if you do 10 to the power of, using the upward caret here, so 10 to the power of, and then we're gonna create a sequence here of values to be the exponent, okay? So this is 10 to the power of this um, of a sequence of exponents here, okay? And I'm gonna say these sequences are gonna range from positive five to negative five, okay? And the length argument is going to be 500. Now you could do 100 here, you could do 1,000 here, it's really up to you. It's going to actually make your, it's going to make your training, um, when you train your lasso regression, it's gonna take longer the more you put here. But what this is saying is, we're gonna create a sequence of values here 
of length 500. And actually, if you just run this, you can get a taste of what this looks like. So we'll just run this, this function here, this the SEQ function from base R um, with just these arguments and ignore the 10 to the power of part. And so what you see here is you get 500 values and the, this, these are our potential lambda values ranging from positive five, that looks familiar, all the way down to negative five here. And if we do the whole vector, so including the 10 to the power of, now we get still 500 values, but this is 10 to the power of whatever the values and it just repeats through all 500 values there, okay? Um, and again, we're gonna assign this, this whole sequence here to the lambda vector object so we can reference it subsequently in our uh, model training function. So let's go ahead and run this. So now we have our lambda vector, okay? If you just click on it here, or if you notice here, we have 500 values and uh, these are the values that we saw over here. All right, so this is overkill, this range that I'm providing here, but I think it's just to be on the safe side, you can provide more length here. Uh, other people will do like three to negative two, um, and they might only do 100 values here, so the length would be 100. Um, that's gonna give you a little bit less refinement in terms of the increments between the lambda values. That's probably inconsequential for the most part. Um, at the same time, it's, we have the computational power today to do these things fairly easily, so why not, okay? All right, the next thing that we're gonna do is we are going to um, set a seed again, okay? And we're just gonna use that set.seed function from base R. And so I'll do set.seed, I'll put the same numeric value here. And this is going to be so we have reproducible model training so we can get the same results every time we run. You just wanna make sure you run the set seed um, immediately before running the function that I'm about to describe to you. Okay, so what we're going to do now is actually specify our lasso regression um, model um, to be that's going to be estimated using um, the training data and k fold, and I'll actually put tenfold because that's what we're specifically doing tenfold cross validation framework or process. So that's what we're doing now, is we're actually gonna specify, finally we're here, we're gonna specify that lasso regression model. Um, and like we would with you know, most of the regression model or most models that we specify in R, we often want to assign the model specifications to an object that we can subsequently reference. So I'm gonna do model one, is what I'm gonna call it, just model one. And that's partly because later on in this tutorial, I'll sh um, if you'd like, there's, you can, there's an optional component where I can show you how to do all this using OLS regression. Okay, um, Okay. so let's do model one here. Let, that's gonna be our name. And use a left-handed arrow operator to assign um, what, we, what we end up, our model specifications, what we end up training to this, this model one object. And we're gonna use the train all lowercase function, that's T-R-A-I-N from the caret package. And the first argument is gonna be simply specifying our model. So we put our outcome variable first. So in this case, it's y for us, lowercase y, and then the tilde to say y regressed on what? Um, well, instead of listing out all 36 x1 through x36 um, predictor variables that we have access to here, so x1 through x36, um, there's a nice little feature in R, which is that if you do a period or a full stop or a dot, however you'd like to call it here, um, this is going to, by default, put all other variables except for this outcome variable um, as the predictor variables. Now, if you have a, other predictor or other variables in your data frame that you don't want to use as predictors, then this is not going to be the right notation. Then you'll want to list out all your variable names here or create a data frame object in which you've only included your outcome variable and the predictor variables you're interested in. Okay, so that's our first argument here. The second argument will probably seem familiar. It's just gonna be data equals, and we're gonna train the model on our training data frame, so the training data. So it's just data equals train underscore df. So we're referencing this object here that we created using our data partitioning process. Now this next step is important, and we're gonna use the pre-process, where the P in process is capitalized, and we're going to grand mean center and standardize our predictor variables. And fortunately, this can be done um, as part of this process, training model process, when you use the train function here. And 
we're just going to specify that we both want to grab mean center and, and scale or standardize these um, the predictor variables. And to do so, we just say preprocess equals, and then we have the C function here, the combined function from base R. And as the first argument, let's just put center in quotes. Second argument, let's put scale in quotes. And so the first um, argument is just to grand mean center. The second one is to standardize the variables. Okay. And now let's move down to the fourth, the fourth argument that we're going to use here. We're going to specify the method that we're going to use to train this model. And so broadly, what we're going to be using is a package uh, as the, a particular method. And this method here is going to be GLM net, which is its own package. You could do all this uh, you can do lasso regression, ridge regression, and so forth within the GLM net package, but I find that it's easier. Um, it has some nice defaults and features when you do it within the caret package. Okay, so GLM net, all lowercase, is our method we're going to select for lasso regression. And then our next argument is tune, uh, tune grid with a capital G for grid. And this is where we're essentially we're creating a, uh, a grid or a data frame that we can plug in and pump through this model as we're iterating through and testing those different tuning parameters. And the, um, the first argument, or rather what we're gonna do is specify is the expand.grid. This is actually a function. Um, so expand.grid. And then as our first argument within that, we're gonna do alpha equals one. Okay, so that's where we're setting our mixing percentage, our alpha tuning parameter to one. Remember, it's gonna be treated as a constant here in um, lasso regression. And then lambda, we are going to set that um, second argument is going to be equal to our vector of lambda values that we created above here, okay? So we're plugging that in. So this is gonna be pumped into our model as well. Now, I believe if we highlight just this function and these parameters, we, you can see what's happening behind the scenes here. Yeah, just as I suspected. So if we come down here to our console, this is what's being plugged into the tune grid argument here. We're, we've created essentially a data frame object here um, where we have the alpha column, alpha variable. You can see that's constant at one. So we're just running lasso regressions here. And then our tuning parameter, our potential tuning parameter values, our lambda value here, um, the regularization parameter, you can see that these are all our 500 values that we specified as part of this sequence, okay? So we're just plugging this grid, this is our tuning grid, we're plugging this into the uh, model training and estimation process. Okay, so the next argument after that is going to be the uh, train control or the TR control, um, TR control with a capital C for control um, argument. And this is where we're gonna say it's equal to control specs and this should look familiar. This is the, the k-fold cross-validation control specs that our training control function, our train control function that we specified here. We're just gonna plug that in here. And this will tell to train the lasso regression model using um, tenfold cross-validation. And then the final argument we're gonna put here, it's not really relevant for these data because I happen to know that this these data, there's no missing values, there's no NAs. Um, but should there be NAs? Um, we're gonna use, if, if you're applying this to other data in which there might be missing data, then um, I'd recommend setting this to na.action equals na.omit. Um, otherwise, it will, if you don't include this argument, it'll default to whatever um, uh, function you're using, so the GLM net function within here. Um, wh however, it'll handle missing data. So what this is gonna do is list-wise deletion. Now, list-wise deletion um, is not such a big deal if we have the data are missing completely at random, for example. However, if we can't meet that, or we don't think we can meet that assumption, um, one thing that happens with list-wise deletion is that we lose out on cases in which we have data that's um, missing on the outcome variable specifically. And so we can actually hurt our statistical power even when uh, data are missing completely at random, okay? And so, um, you can, and this is way beyond the scope of this tutorial, um, you can within the caret package and the, using the train function, you can create your own models um, where let's say you could potentially create a model where you could use maximum likelihood estimation, for example, and use that as a way to, um, as a way of handling missing data uh, within your model. Um, in this case, we have access to a lot of data here. And so we'll just make the assumption that these data are 
representative of the underlying population, even if we were to have missing values, okay? Whether or not that's tenable um, that of an assumption, you know, that remains to be seen. All right, so now we've completed our argument structure. Let's go ahead and run the train function and assign it its output to the model one object here. Okay. Sometimes this can take a while, especially the length of your lambda val uh, vector could cause this to take a while. So we'll wait here while this iterates through. Okay, so it ran through and um, it's pretty typical to get this um, warning message here. This is not an error message, this is a warning message. And it just says there's missing values in the resampled performance measures. Um, we really don't need to worry about this here. This is just a fairly common um, warning. Um, the model should have run just fine. Okay, so you can essentially ignore this particular warning message here. Um, if you get an error message, that's something else. That means that the model did not run. Okay, or it was not trained, or rather, the, the it was not trained. The lasso regression did not train um, or complete its training. Okay, so let's now siphon through different types of output that we can uh, look at that come from this model, okay? So the first thing that we're gonna do is find the best or optimal, what was the optimal tuning parameter, the optimal lambda value, in other words, for both um, alpha and lambda, okay? And if we want both of those, we know that alpha is already gonna be one because it was set as a constant, but for fun, we can just do, reference the name of our object, model one, followed by the dollar sign operator and then best tune. So the best tuning parameter and that's tune with a capital T. We run that. Okay. We see the optimal lambda value here is 0 0.0168443. So this is our optimal lambda value. So after running through the, um, uh, so running through all of the um, different iterations of the K fold cross validation, so across the 10 folds of model training and running through that whole vector of lambda values that we fed into it, um, it arrived at this lambda value as being the optimal lambda value in terms of minimizing what the default here is going to be the RMSE, the root mean squared error of the model, okay? So it essentially looked across the, the different folds of our tenfold cross-validation and came up with kind of the average best lambda value. And this is what we found here. And this is what's then applied to, as part of the k-fold cross-validation at the final step, this lambda value is applied to then estimating a model with all 801 observations or cases from the training data frame, okay? So that's what we see there. Now, if we wanted to just get the, um, if we want to just get the, since we know that alpha is going to be equal to one, um, and if we just wanted to request or reference the lambda, the optimal lambda value, then we can just do a simple extension to this. So we can just take, let's copy and paste that line, add another dollar sign here, and just type in lambda, okay? All lowercase, click run, and this just gives us our lambda value, okay? Not a big deal, but um, sometimes if you want to reference that later on, um, that's how you do that. All right, so let's now take a look at the actual um, lasso regression model coefficients. So these are our parameter estimates. And remember with lasso regression, the goal is to um, reduce the amount of variance around these regression coefficients um, or parameter estimates, even if it comes at introducing more bias or allowing more bias to creep in, okay? And so let's, uh, the way that we're going to do this is we're going to use the coef for coefficients uh, function from uh, the, from base R, come standard with R. And as the first argument, we're going to specify the name of our, our model, which is model one object that we specified above. And then we're going to do final model, model with a capital M there. That's our first argument. So we're saying we want to select the, the final model here, the coefficients for those. And then we're going to actually, let's just copy this, the model one best tune lambda value. We're gonna say select, so essentially what are the coefficients for the final model, which means the model in which after we ran through all the 10 folds cross validation, um, where we had segmented the data behind the scenes. And again, if you wanna learn more about this process, go to the, ten, the K fold cross validation in R um, tutorial, but behind the scenes, ran through that, came up with the optimal lambda value, and now we're applying the optimal lambda value 
um, when we to the entire training data frame set and trying to estimate and then actually not trying but um, succeeding in ex estimating the uh, final regression model based on 801 observations here okay so that's what we're about to pull up here those coefficients so let's click run here okay so as our output you can see here we get this sparse matrix and we get our intercept value here okay and notice that all these values are in scientific notation, so that's just um, you know one thing to consider there. Um, and actually, I think if we use the round function, I'm not entirely sure if this is going to work with a sparse parameter object, but let's see. Um, so I'm the round function, first argument is the data, second argument is the digits after zero, or the uh, places after the decimal place. Let's see if this works. Okay, yeah, so that worked. So that's just the round function from base R. And so this makes it a little bit easier to interpret it outside of scientific notation. So here's our intercept value. Um, here are the different regression coefficients. And you'll notice that some regression coefficients have periods or full stops or just dots here instead of actual regression coefficients. And again, these are parameter estimates, um, these regression coefficients. And what this is doing, this is where that shrinkage, this, this regularization process and this shrinkage from the last regression, remember it's pulling the regression coefficients closer to zero and some of them it's actually zeroing out the smallest ones it's zeroing out which means it's eliminating these as predictors in the model so this is how you can see it's a feature selection or variable selection model those um, regression coefficients associated with these predictor variables like for instance these predictor variables x1 through x4 were kept in the model x5 was essentially eliminated from the model because it has a, no core regression coefficient here. Its regression coefficient is zero in other words, okay? So you can see how we've reduced the set of originally 36 predictor variables to, I don't know, it looks like we've reduced it down by 10 to 15 or so. Um, so we've simplified this model. So we've created a model that's more parsimonious in other words, okay? All right, so um, moving right along, the next thing that we can do is we can actually plot um, the outcome, or uh, we can actually plot and create a plot of root mean squared error, the RMSE for our model in relation to the, um, the sequence or the vector of lambda values. So to create that plot or that of, of the, our lambda values, that sequence of lambda values, that vector of lambda values in relation to the root mean squared error to get a visualization of how we're really trying to optimize that lambda, find that optimal lambda value based on minimizing the root mean squared error or the RMSE, we can create a plot that looks like the following, okay? And so just we'll plot what is actually going to be the log or the logarithm of lambda, okay? And the reason we're using the log of lambda is for uh, visual interpretation purposes. And the root, and I'll just abbreviate that as the root mean squared error, okay? And so we're gonna use the plot function from base R to do this. And as our first argument, we're going to just do the log of the model one dollar sign results. So this is requesting the results from our model one and those lambda uh, lambda values. And so if you just run this right here, this should look familiar. This is just the 500 lambda values that we fed in to that model, okay? So um, you could essentially just use the, um, the lambda vector two here if you wanted but we're gonna take the log of this. So we're using the log function from base R here to do the, uh, apply a logarithm transformation, a log transformation to those values. Okay, and again, this is for interpretation purposes. And so that's our first argument. So that's gonna be our x-axis uh, values. And then our, our y-axis values are gonna be model one, dollar sign, results again, because we wanna request the model results. And then we're just gonna request the RMSE, okay? So the root mean squared residual, that'll be our y-axis. And then I'm gonna give some just quick labels. So x lab equals for the x-axis label, I'm gonna say log uh, lambda, just to remind us that this is not the raw lambda values. This is actually a, a log transformation of them for interpretation. And the x-axis um, label is going to be, I'll just put RMSE for short, root mean squared error. And I'm just going to, well, let's save this last argument for now. And let's run this and plot it. Okay. So as you can see here, there's, uh, this is not really useful information kind of on these tails here. Uh, you just see that we kind of reach a steady point 
with these very negative log lambda values and these very positive ones. So I'm gonna adapt this now and just control down or actually limit, put limits on our X axis here. So outer limits, so I'm gonna do X lim equals, and I'm using the C function from uh, base R, the combined function to say what the lower limit's gonna be negative five, let's say, so like right here, and zero looks appropriate for the upper limit. So second argument is zero. And let's rerun here. Okay, I'm gonna now uh, pop this out here. And so here you can see the log lambda values here and the uh, root mean squared error. And you can see that we're really trying to minimize, it looks like the minimal um, root mean squared error is around uh, a log lambda of about negative four, okay? And yeah, so it looks about, yeah, it looks about negative four. And you can see that RMSE um, increases on either side of that. So what is a log lambda, roughly speaking of negative four, this is just ballpark. If we put log negative four in here, so what's the, the uh, logarithm of negative four? Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, other way around. So we actually, well, let's do it this way. This will probably be more interpretable here. Um, what we're gonna do is let's actually take what was our best tuning lambda value and go the other way and do what's the log, the logarithm of that optimal lambda value, which if you remember was like, it was like 0 0.0168 or something like that. Well, actually we can just run it right here. So the value was 0 0.0168, okay, good memory, David. And if we take the log of that, we'll see it's about negative four. Okay, so that jibes with and corresponds to what we see here visually. So this is, you don't need to run this plot, but this is just kind of what's happening behind the scenes. It's searching along, trying to minimize that RMSE, uh, cause that's the default performance metric. Um, and uh, that's what it was trying to really um, optimize there, okay. And just quickly, you could also, I believe you can, let's see here. Oh no, that's, I don't think that's gonna come standard. Let's see, yeah, oh yeah, we can throw in R squared here. I'm not gonna change the names of the, the values here or the, the, the Y axis, but let's uh, run that. And so here you can see alternatively how it's trying to maximize the, um, the R squared value. This should say R squared, I'm just not changing that for convenience. But we, that's not how we actually train the model. The default we use is it's trying to minimize the error and specifically the root mean squared error in prediction of the model, okay? Um, there are ways with the above function that we could, um, we could go back up here and actually specify that we wanted to have the um, uh, R squared be the performance metric of focus here. And if that were the case, uh, check out the written tutorial version of this tutorial and I go uh, provide a little bit more explanation about how to do that. Okay, so um, that is essentially what we've done thus far. So the next step is that let's actually um, create a function to um, calculate the, well, and actually let's, let's, let's go ahead and skip on to, um, instead of doing that, what I would like to do now is to actually create a, and compare the variable importance of the different predictor variables in our model. Okay, so let's look at the variable importance. And just remember this is predictor variable importance. And so there's a function within the caret package called var imp. So uh, var imp with a capital I for I am before IMP. Okay. And here we can just put in the name of our model object. So model one. And so this will give us our variable importance. Okay. So it'll rank the, the variables in terms of importance from zero to a hundred. And it only shows you the 20 most important variables out of um, 36 by default here. Um, and as you can see, the top one is the X2 predictor variable is considered the most important, uh, followed closely behind by the X8 and so forth and so on down. Now, I actually like to do this. I think visually this can be represented a little bit easier and a little bit uh, easier to interpret that is. And so let's do a data visualization of variable importance. And this is super easy to implement. Um, if you haven't done this before, install the ggplot2 package, okay? I've recently done that, so I'm gonna put a hashtag in front of it, so I'm not gonna run that, but you might need to run it. And then do library ggplot2, and definitely run this function to access ggplot2 and its, its functions, because specifically we're going to access the ggplot function from the ggplot2 package. And let's just copy that whole function and its argument, put it in the ggplot parentheses here, 
I'm gonna expand out this viewer window here, the plots window so we can actually see the output. So let's run that. Okay, so now you get, <clears throat> you get this plot here, which is really nice, which shows us what we could have seen over here in text. But now we see this visually. So we, again, we see X2 is the most important variable. They call the variables features here because remember lasso is sometimes described as a feature selection method or variable selection method. Um, and then here we have the level of importance and anything where you don't see a bar here just indicates that the, um, that that variable was zeroed out here. So these are all, this is how we made the model more parsimonious here. Okay, so that's the um, data visualization component there. And so the next step that we're gonna do is actually um, see how well our model actually predicts new, uh, predicts the outcome when we give it new data. Okay, so to see how well, and this is really where we, um, let's just call this model prediction. Okay, so we've trained the model using tenfold cross-validation, this is specifically a lasso regression model. We found the optimal um, regret, we found the optimal um, lambda value. And then we estimated the, the, the uh, coefficients and so forth, and, um, and we were able to see how well those, what the model coefficients were on the actual full training data set. Now we're gonna see how well our model, in terms of having that lambda value, um, when we, that we tune this, this best, this optimal lambda value, when we apply this model that we just, um, this final model we just created here, and we give it new data, how well does it actually predict the outcome, okay? And so remember way back when we partitioned the data, we, came, we created a training data frame, train underscore DF, and we also created a test data frame, test underscore DF. You can see this represented over here. Okay, I just pulled that up there as well. Well, now we're going to apply our model, our final model that we trained from the lasso regression to the test underscore DF um, holdout data, the data that the model has not yet seen. Okay, so we're gonna create an object, let's call this predictions one, you could call it whatever you want, but I'm gonna call it predictions one and use the left-handed arrow operator here to assign values to it. And then I'm gonna use the predict function from um, base R here. Okay, so predict all lowercase. And as a first argument, we're gonna plug in the model information from the model we estimated above, that we trained above rather, the model one. Okay, the last regression model there specifically. That's our first argument. Our second argument is saying, now let's throw this at the, uh, or rather, this should be new data argument, new data equals test underscore DF, okay? So this is gonna see how well we can predict that outcome variable Y when we apply this model we trained to new data, okay? So this is where we're really looking at kind of more true predictive analytics framework. So let's run that. Okay, so we came up with our predictions. This is just a vector of predictions here if we look at that. We get, uh, here we have all the different predictions. Oops. Perfect, so we get all the, the predictions and we can now then evaluate these in terms of trying to understand the overall model performance, the model accuracy and prediction. So let's see how well the model actually predicted. Because remember, that's our goal here with um, lasso regression, is to see how well our model actually predicts, okay? Um, when we give it new data. So I'm gonna actually create a data frame object um, that can summarize these results for us. And so the way that we'll do that is, let's make it clear that this model performance or accuracy here, is I'm gonna call this data frame object mod one perf, totally arbitrary, but that's what I'm gonna call it here and use the left-handed arrow object to assign um, the data frame object to it. And I'm gonna use the data.frame function from base R to create a data frame. And I'm gonna create two variables as part of this data frame. The first one is going to be, let's call this variable RMS, oops, RMSE equals. And then we're gonna use the RMSE function from the caret package. So um, these are labeled the same thing, but this is the name. We could choose whatever we want for this before the equal sign. This is actually the name of a function here. And then as the first argument within the RMSE function, we're gonna put that vector predictions one. And then we are going to put test underscore uh, DF, the name of our data frame object, followed by our outcome variable. 
And what we're saying here is we want to calculate the root mean squared error for our uh, based on our model predictions and by seeing how well our predictions actually map onto or how accurate they are with respect to the actual observed outcome values here, okay? So that's our first variable we're creating in this data frame. And you could just run, if we just highlight this, run this function by itself, okay? And, oh yeah, sorry, went a little bit, there we go. Okay, so the RMSC is 0.86. So that's our final RMSC. We want as low of an RMSC as possible. By itself, this isn't gonna mean a ton. Usually this is better to consider RMSC when we're doing model comparisons. Okay, so what's the second variable in our data frame? Well, let's call this second variable R squared, okay? We can call this whatever we wanted, but I'm calling this R squared here. And then we're gonna use the R, capital R2, which is R squared function from the caret package and the next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna plug in the same arguments from RMSC. So I'll just copy those and put those within the print, oops. And put those within the parentheses here, okay? So it's the same arguments as we do for RMSE. And so we're just creating a data frame. It's gonna have two variables, RMSE, R squared, and you'll see that in a second, we're gonna call it this mod one per data frame object. So let's run this. Okay, so we've created this object here. We could view it in our console like this. Okay, or we could come over here and take a peek at it in this window. So in our console here, you can see we saw the RMSE value already. Here's the R squared value is 0.41. And so the R squared value is a little bit more because it is can be interpreted as an effect size. It's a little bit more easily directly interpreted, uh, interpretable rather. And so the way that we would do that is uh, usually we use like rules of thumb, like um, a small would be an R squared of 0 0.01, a medium would be an R squared of 0 0.09, and a large would be an R squared of 0.25, okay? And so that essentially um, shows us how well our model actually performed here. Now, I'm gonna stop here for this version, this is, so I've just showed you how to train a lasso regression model using k-fold cross-validation, and then I showed you how to actually apply the final model with the, the optimal lambda tuning val uh, value to um, new data, so we can apply that model um, and knowing what we know about the optimal lambda value um, to new data and see how well that model performs that we tuned on the training data when we give it new data, which was our test data, and here we get the, the model performance metrics uh, or performance indicators here of RMSC, root mean squared error, and the R squared value, okay? In a subsequent part two to this video, if you'd like to continue on, I will show you how this process, how if we use the same data, but instead of using lasso regression, use OLS or ordinary least squares regression, linear regression, how well an OLS linear regression model trained on the same data compares to a uh, compares to the lasso regression that we just estimated. Thank you.